Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first Kari online lecture of 2022. I'm Lindy Krug, Kari's director, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Edna Stern, who is a current recipient of a Kari Kaok Fellowship. And this semester, our lecture series will focus on the research of our four Kari Kaok Fellows who have had to postpone their research visits to Cyprus because of the pandemic, but who will be joining us at some point this year. For those of you who are not familiar with KAOC, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers is a nonprofit organization that supports its 25 member organizations around the world, including CARI. They receive funding from sources including the US Department of State, the US Department of Education, and the Smithsonian, as well as private donors. Each year, they award CARI funds for two US postdoctoral fellows to travel to Cyprus and conduct research, and we're very grateful to have this support in addition to the support they also give us to help with our operating costs. And the calendar for the Kari Keo Collector Program can be found on our website at kari.org and Zoom links will be provided closer to the events. For those who are not regular attendees of our Kari lectures, and this evening I think we have quite a few who have come especially to hear Edna, but if you're interested in hearing more about Cypriot archaeology, Anthula has also put her email into the chat and you can drop her an email and request to be added to the mailing list. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Edna Stern. Edna Stern, who would have been with us at Kari now, but has had to postpone her visit for now until the autumn, will be speaking to us from Israel this evening. Dr. Stern is a senior research archeologist and med medieval pottery specialist at the archeological research department of the Israel Antiquities Authority. She's also a teaching associate in the Department of Maritime Civilizations and research associate at the Leon Racanati Institute for Maritime Studies, both at the University of Haifa. She's also an associated researcher at the Archaeology and Archaeometry Laboratory of the CNRS at Leon University. Dr. Stern obtained her PhD in 2007 at the University of Haifa. She has extensive experience in the field and the lab, and her research focuses on Crusader and Mamluk material culture in Israel especially ceramic finds from Akko, Safed, Yafo, Ramla, and other sites. She studies these ceramics in the context of their maritime trade and distribution, as well as in relation to ceramic assemblages from other Mediterranean sites. Collaborating with archeologists and scientists from Israel and abroad, she's participated in research using analytical analysis to further understand production, distribution, and cultural attribution of the ceramics. Beyond Israel archaeology, she's also studied medieval Cypriot pottery and collaborates with several Cypriot projects and researchers. Dr. Stone is also interested in the archaeology of sugar production, urban and rural sites, and crusader food and food habits, and is a collaborator in several international research projects in these areas. She's a single or joint author on several books, including Pottery of the Crusader, Ayyubid and Mamluk periods in Israel, and has published numerous articles. I would now like to invite Dr. Stern to present her lecture entitled Venice, Cyprus and the Southern Levant in the fourth centuries, a reflection of contacts. Thank you, Edna. Thank you very much, Lindy, for and good evening to everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Um, oh, good, thank you. Okay, fine, great. So we can start. Um, okay, so as uh, Lindy said, I, I have been working with the Israel Antiquity Authority for over the past three decades as an archeologist and medieval pottery specialist. And I have been engaged in the study of excavated ceramics, uh, mainly dating from the Crusader, Mamluk and Ottoman periods from urban sites and numerous rural sites. In addition, I'm required to visit ongoing excavations to consult the archeologists regarding their ceramic finds. As a result, I have studied large quantities of uh, pottery from these uh, periods from many types of excavated sites. And in my dissertation, I investigated Crusader period imported ceramics, which subsequently also allowed me to identify imports 
from the Mamluk and early Ottoman contexts. In my research, apart from identifying and dating the ceramics, I address questions regarding production, trade, distribution of ceramics across the Mediterranean. So we're in this framework, I have visited Cyprus several times to study Cypriot pottery, first from the Crusader or Lusignan period, and then of the later Venetian period. So now is a good time to thank uh, all my colleagues in Cyprus for allowing me uh, to see their materials and for discussing the finds. Uh, I, I cannot name all of them, but I would especially like to thank uh, Demetra Papanikola Bakirjis, Marie-Louise von Warburg, uh, Smadal Gavrieli, and of course, uh, many others. And I would like also to take the chance now to, to thank my colleagues in Israel, uh, Hervé Barbet, Yoav Arbel, uh, Ronnie Twegg, Edna Amos, and many, many others for sharing their finds. Without collecting data, from all of their excavations, this synthesis could not have been possible. And I forgot to put the first slide uh, where you can see um, how we sort pottery on the field. So the research that I plan to conduct in Cyprus um, is part of a larger project that I initiated in which I am looking into the archeological evidence of Venetian and Latin presence in the Holy Land or the Southern Bila de Sham during the Mamluk and Ottoman periods using the ceramic finds. Um, and I received the fellowship uh, at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem, which I just uh, finished in two segments uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, I'm looking forward um, also to do research in Cyprus. So um, this project was initiated by the very small ceramic shares of imported wares that I began to identify, not only in the urban centers, but also in the rural villages. These ceramics uh, sparked my interest to pursue the significance of these maritime trade artifacts that the Venetian merchants and the Latin pilgrims left in this region. So the Cypriot segment of this research is in an attempt to reconstruct the connection between Cyprus, the Southern Levant, and the Venetian merchants through the evidence of, of the ceramic trades. Archaeological research of the medieval and early modern periods is, a relatively, is relatively new in modern Israel as in Cyprus. However, the start, study of the ceramics in Israel is not as developed as in Cyprus. In Israel, the majority of these ceramics, when found in rural contexts, were overlooked or misidentified as local products mainly due to methodological difficulties in identifying uh, glazed wares. For example, some imports are covered with monochrome glaze, usually green, that can be very easily mistaken for local production, as you can see here on the slide. Uh, in addition, Italian and Cypriot wares have a decorative scheme of incised designs and addition of green and yellow glaze, just like the ones that you can see on the left from the Crusader period, the Port St. Simeon ware. It is only by close observation of fabric and the form that they can be properly identified. Imported wares, mainly from Italy, Spain, and China, and more recently, also a few examples from Cyprus, have been found and identified at the urban provincial capitals that serve the Mamluk governmental and religious centers and economic hubs at Safad and Jerusalem, and also at Ramla, which you can see here, um, a commercial center situated on the important Cairo-Damascus postal road, the Barit, and on the road from the port of Jaffa to Jerusalem. Their percentage within the ceramic assemblages is very low. Um, few, very few examples have also been found in the seacoast sites of Acre and Jaffa. The 
former important crusader ports that were now abandoned. Over the years, while sorting pottery from various rural sites, I identified uh, imported Italian vessels presented in Mamluk and early Ottoman contexts of uh, rural villages in the Galilee up here, situated both near the coast and further inland. These vessels are mostly represented only by small sherds, and it has become clear that these sherds have been con consistently overlooked or misidentified. I have identified the same uh, phenomena okay, at I'll sites in like, the countryside I'll, I'll of Ramla and like Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah. Uh, these sites are all the red dots in the distribution map. Please note that this is work in progress, and am I, I am certain that there are many more sites that I did not get to yet that also have imports. In the northern part of Israel, of sites that yielded imported pottery, I found that Italian imports appear at at least a third of contemporaneous Mamluk rural uh, sites meaning that they were found in one out of three villages. This groundbreaking discovery that I made already more than 10 years ago needs reassessment of the mechanisms that brought this pottery there. Another more recent site find was that at some sites they appear in quite high percentages. In a count made at the storerooms of an excavation from the 1970s, at the village of Teleras, some six kilometers from Acre, one out of every five glazed bowls was imported. A fifth of the glazed bowls were imported. Although it is close to Acre, this percentage raises questions as to the cultural identity of these rural consumers. So clearly, all these imported ceramics, rare and unique during this period, must be, must they be concealing information as to where they were produced, what influenced their decorations, who brought them by sea, how and why. As most of the ceramics are Venetian, there seems to be a clear link between these finds and the activity of the Venetian merchants in the region. Historical documents indicate that Venetian merchants came to the Southern Levant to purchase cotton directly from local peasants. And in the 15th century, they had representatives living in the ruins of the Crusader city of Acre. They also transported Europeans on their way to pilgrimage in the Holy Land through the ports of Acre and Jaffa. Despite information in textual sources, archaeological evidence for the activity of the Venetian merchants in modern day Israel is scarce in comparison to their presence in other regions of the Mediterranean, such as Cyprus, Crete, or Alexandria in Egypt, and is, exact, and is actually non existing for the possible activity of Cypriot mariners. So as you can understand from this, I would like to make an attempt to trace Venetian and Cypriot merchants and mar uh, mariners activities through the ceramic finds. So before describing these finds and discussing their meaning, here is a brief historical background. With the final Mamluk conquest of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem in 1291, the former territory became part of the Mamluk Sultanate and most of the Frankish population was expelled. Many found refuge in Lusignan, Cyprus. The former Latin kingdom was trans transformed at once from a flourishing hub of international sea and land trade with investments in agriculture, industry, and with social, social and cultural diversity to a remote part of the Mamluk Empire, whose capital was in Cairo. Under Mamluk rule, the region witnessed a transformation of economic conditions. The local Muslim population, which consists mainly of non-elites, 
was mostly settled in the villages. Only in urban centers of uh, Jerusalem, Ramla, and Sfat, the population was of a higher rank, including government representatives and merchants. According to the historical sources, the former principal crusader ports of Acre and Jaffa were destroyed by the Mamluks and left in ruins to deter further crusades. The aftermath of the Mamluk conquest of the Holy Land of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem and the subsequent maritime connection with Cyprus is an unexplored episode. A papal ban on trade with the Mamluks after the conquest of Crusader Acre in 1291 restricted direct trade from Europe. The Cypriots, however, had papal exemptions from the ban, and Cyprus, under the Lusignan and later Venetian rule, became a reshipment point for merchandise to the Le Levantine coast in Egypt. Notwith notwithstanding, despite the papal embargo, Venetian merchants were granted permission already in 1304 uh, by the Emir of Safad to moor in the Bay of Acre. Later, they were also allowed to settle and trade in Acre and to bring pilgrims to the port of Jaffa. So the ceramics in question entered through the now destroyed ports of Jaffa and Acre. What do we know about these sites during the 14th to the 16th century? So where Acre is situated on a natural bay with very good mooring conditions, regardless of the existence of a built port. Therefore, once the Crusader city was conquered and destroyed by the Mamluk Sultan eh, El Malik El Ashraf Khalil in 1291 and was in ruins, as, as the textual sources indicate, ships could continue to frequent this port. Archaeological excavations in various parts uh, throughout the city all show the same picture. Over, over the Crusader period remains, there is a very thick layer of burnt debris following the Mamluk scorched earth policy. So these are actually Crusader period, uh, period buildings uh, in ruins. Between the Crusader layer of debris and the Ottoman period remains, mostly uh, remains of the 18th century, there is a clear gap. The gap is actually a layer of wind-blown sand. In this intermean period, there are only a handful of finds in Old Acre and its close surroundings. Uh, for instance, there are over 30 coins that were found in various excavations and are pending further research. Um, other archaeological remains include 11 wooden columns of non-local pine dated by carbon 14 to the mid 15th century found at an underwater survey in the harbor that may have constituted the support for a pier used for mooring large ships near the harbor entrance. And the second find is an inscription incorporated in a tower named Burj el Sultan overlooking the harbor, and here you can see uh, the spot. Um, and the inscription is dedicated to El Malik El Ashraf Saif Eddin Barbasi, the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, and it dates to 1436 to uh, 37. Um, this inscription mentions the construction of a building probably the renovation of this crusader tower. In, uh, and it is most likely that a Mamluk garrison was stationed to overlook the maritime activity going on in the port. Moving to Jaffa, um, despite the poor harbor in which you can see here, uh, there are reefs that prevent large ships to approach the shore. So despite this, Jaffa was the main port of Jerusalem, and hence its importance throughout history. 
Crusader Jaffa was also conquered by the Mamluks, led by Baibars in 1268, but the city was finally destroyed in 1330. And uh, uh, we can see here from this illustration that a Mamluk garrison reside in the towers of the destroyed uh, citadel. You can see them here, overlooking the port activity, perhaps like an acre. Uh, what we can also see on this illustration from the late 15th century is that the city is in ruins, there are tents, huts, and vaults. The historical sources mention that the pilgrims that arrived through this port stayed in caves, which were probably the ruined Crusader period building. Other evidence uh, is, uh, ex comes from an excavation of a cemetery dating to the Mamluk and early Ottoman period that exposed burials of young males uh, interpreted as the Mamluk soldiers that were stationed there. And this cemetery is exactly sandwiched between the Crusader period remains and the later Ottoman remains. And as in Acre, the excavation results also show a clear archaeological gap between the Crusader and Ottoman period remains uh, when the, um, the city was uh, settled again in the second half of the 18th century. And here again, you can see uh, the sand of this gap period. So in both these ports, vast amounts of Crusader and Ottoman period pottery were unearthed. However, during the archeological gap period, there are only very, very few ceramic finds. What you see on this slide to the left of the green line are the only ceramic finds from this period in Acre. And they are only uh, Venetian imports. And uh, this beautiful fragment, which uh, we used uh, for uh, the advertisement of uh, this lecture, uh, depicts a male figure in profile, probably a noble or a merchant. It dates to the late 15th and early 16th century and was produced in Venice or in its surroundings. And you can see here examples from uh, the Cadoro uh, Museum of vessels uh, produced in uh, similar techniques. And here we have a fragment of a jug, which in exact uh, same, you can see here the same uh, decoration um, was found in Venice. At Jaffa, there's even a smaller number of imports a one from Venice that you can see on the left, and uh, three fragments, one uh, from Cyprus and the other two a uh, question mark if they are from Cyprus. So now we uh, will quickly move to the urban provincial capital of uh, Safad that served as the Mamluk governmental and religious center uh, and economic hub and here, uh, imported ceramics have been uh, unearthed in both excavations at the castle and at the El Wata residential quarter. This clearly demonstrates that they were used at Safad by all social classes. It is important to stress that, all, that through quantification, it is obvious that the imports were found in very small percentage, percentages, as you can see here. Um, of course, more at the castle in the dark uh, blue and less at the neighborhood. On this map, you can see in purple the regions from which these ceramics were imported um, to Safad and they include uh, Italy, uh, Valencia in Spain, Cyprus, China, and also Egypt, Damascus, and Raqqa. And here you can see the uh, European and Cypriot and Chinese uh, pottery that was found. 
So while looking into the archeological evidence of Venetian and Latin presence in the Holy Land during the Mamluk and early Ottoman rule using mainly ceramic finds, it seems quite obvious that Cyprus should be part of this story. Well, Cypriot pottery from this period has been found. And we know that the Venetians were present on the island while trading with the mainland. And also historical sources indicate that Cypriot merchants were used as middlemen for the trade with the former Crusader kingdom. All this highlights once again, the geographic and economic strategic importance of Cyprus. The actions and effects of foreign powers that gradually took over the island and its connection to the mainland in a period whose archeology span is very little known. So now we're uh, approaching uh, the Cypriot connection. So there are two Cypriot ceramic aspects in this research that seem to indicate a Cypriot connection and they were yet unexplored. And uh, as I keep on repeating, they seem to be tangible evidence of the maritime connections with Cyprus and of the Venetian uh, involvement. So the first is a handful of uh, fragments of Cypriot glazed bowls dating to the 14th and 15th uh, century in the urban centers. And the second is a possible local production that may have been inspired from, from contemporary Cypriot ceramics. So uh, we're going back now uh, to look up, oh, sorry, to look at the ceramics. And here uh, we can see again um, the ceramics uh, identified in Jaffa. Uh, this is actually, I think, the biggest fragment of uh, Cypriot uh, ceramic that we have. And we'll talk about them a bit later. But also in other urban centers, we have some um, Cypriot pottery that was identified. From Ramla, you can see here uh, three uh, examples. You can see that these are very, very small fragments. Uh, from Safad, we have even a smaller fragment. It's, there's like a competition, uh, which fragment is smaller? Um, and from Jerusalem, uh, Kay Prague uh, published another small fragment and uh, she wrote that uh, Veronique Francois helped her to identify it as a Cypriot import. I only uh, saw this fragment in the publication. Um, I could not uh, further study it. So looking now into um, the ceramics from Cyprus, looking deeper into them, um, this fragment from the excavation uh, on Ben Gamliel Street comes from a fill, not, not from a well-dated context, but it immediately stood out as a, uh, having a different decoration and uh, unidentified uh, from the Crusader period or from the Ottoman period. And uh, when the excavator uh, showed it to me, of course, it looked very similar. And uh, going uh, to the literature, uh, I could identify it as a, a vessel uh, from Lapitos that was produced uh, probably in the uh, 16th century. Uh, now, medieval production began and flourished in uh, Lapitos under the Lusignans from the late 14th and 15th century. And their productions were distributed throughout the island to Rhodes and to the southern coasts of Asia Minor. Um, Later, after the Ottoman conquest, there was a deterioration of the very rich uh, green and brown scraffito ware to green uh, painted scraffito and finally only green painted ware. And accordingly, they were also distributed to a lesser extent beyond the island. Um, so not only that the decoration is similar, 
But uh, looking at the fabric, the fabric is very macaceous and it is typical to the geology of the Lapitos region. So uh, therefore we can uh, say that this is an import of the 16th century, a, a period when uh, in Jaffa, there was not really a functioning city, but uh, as we know from evidence uh, from Ramallah in Jerusalem, they, there was a lot of maritime uh, activity going on there. And now the other two shirts that we have from Jaffa are probably coming from the same uh, vessel. They have uh, the same uh, fabric. And this fabric clearly indicates that it was imported. Um, now it is possible that it was produced in uh, Soli in the area of Morfu, uh, where the geology contains acid indigenous rocks like granite. Um, and this observation was made by uh, Anastasia Shapiro, who also uh, collaborates with me uh, with petrographic and petrologic uh, analysis of uh, the ceramic fragments that we find. Now, not only that the uh, fabric suggested this, also uh, I consulted with uh, Demetra Papanikola Bakirjis uh, only by email, she didn't see the, the finds, but uh, by photo, she also um, um, suggested that it may be coming from uh, Soli. But of course, this is a question mark and should be further uh, researched. So here we are looking at the tiny, tiny fragment from uh, Cyprus, from Safad, I'm sorry, and another fragment uh, found in Ramla. And here you can see examples of Cypriot bowls from the 14th century. So during this period, they either have careless incised motifs like this bowl, or more precisely executed incised designs, uh, many of them uh, the wedding the well-known uh, wedding bows and uh, it seems that these were produced in different um, cypriot workshops and uh, as far as i know they are uh, not uh, well known yet uh, it seems that this example from cyprus uh, is from a bowl similar to um, the wedding bowls you can see the very fine uh, execution here and also of course uh, the fabric indicates uh, the region of Cyprus or similar uh, ge ge geological um, out out uh, crops and uh, the fragment from uh, Ramla you can see that the decoration is a uh, very very similar um, to um, to uh, this bowl uh, from Cyprus. Now, the other two bowls from Cyprus have a red slip, a scrafito, and a green and yellow glaze. Uh, you can see them here on the left. Um, it is uh, very likely that they were produced in Edkomi or at other workshops that uh, produced a uh, scrafito pottery with a uh, red uh, slip. Again, this is something uh, that has to be further, um, further uh, researched. And you can see that this bowl here has a coat of arms. Uh, you see just the beginning of it. And here is a bowl from Encomi that also has a coat of arms. So, um, it is very likely um, coming from Encomi. And now we're moving on to the second uh, issue that I wanted to talk about regarding the Cypriot pottery. And now I'm showing you a local production of the Southern Levant, a type that was named many years ago by Dennis Kringle, yellow and green gouged ware. Due to a uh, deep gouging and uh, thin scafito, and uh, covered with a very thick white or pinkish slip, 
and over it yellow glazed with careless green splashes. Here you can see quite a few examples of bowls that were found in um, the excavations of the Safad castle. Um, some bowls were restored and some we have fragments. Unfortunately, they were photographed in different conditions, but uh, the color scheme is uh, the same, uh, more or less. Um, what is very interesting that there are recurring, um, recurring designs, mostly of straight and wavy and zigzag lines. Um, in Safat, they were found in a very, very clear context, most of them. We found uh, over 80 bowls and fragments, but uh, these um, restored ones were found together with a hoard of coins dating from the mid 15th century, Venetian coins and uh, Mamluk coins, silver coins. So um, the date is uh, quite well established. And um, actually, uh, there is a support for this date also from finds in Nazareth and Ramla, which uh, also date them to the 14th and 15th century. In the past, uh, they were dated to the 13th century, but now, uh, we are quite sure that they uh, only appear uh, later. We don't know exactly the, the exact uh, chronological um, uh, frame of, of this type, but as we have, as the evidence that we have from here, um, they were around in the 15th century and in the 14th century. Now regarding their provenience, a petrographical analysis for bowls found at uh, Safad from Katserin, from another site, uh, Hirbet Danila, all in the Northern part of Israel and in Karak uh, Castle, uh, all show that they have the same petrographic uh, profile and that they were produced from a uh, lower Cretaceous formations. And on this map, you can see the, the green uh, color shows the outcrops of um, the, this Cretaceous um, formation. And a petrography cannot pinpoint uh, to one of the places, but it accords very well with the distribution of this wear, because as I said, it is found in Kerak and also in many sites in Jordan in Lebanon, in Syria, in the Damascus uh, castle, etc. So, um, if you're familiar with uh, Cypriot pottery, you can immediately see that there is some um, there are some features that are similar uh, to the Cypriot pottery, uh, mainly the designs. Um, um, the zigzag designs, and I actually, I even have here, let's see if I'll be able to show you. Um, I even have here a 13th century uh, Cypriot bowl, and you can also see this zigzag filling. Um, so there are some things that are similar to the Cypriot uh, pottery. But of course, you should keep in mind that uh, these, they are of different size and different shapes. Uh, I'm showing you here a, a Cypriot bowl, which is about, uh, this bowl is 17 centimeters in diameter. And this bowl is about 50 centimeters. So they are of very different sizes and this may uh, be uh, connected to the different dining habits of um, the Franks and of the Muslims. The Franks usually use the smaller uh, dishes also during the Crusader period. And the Muslims uh, dined from one large uh, vessel. Uh, they sat on the floor. Um, and this apparently is the reason for uh, the difficult sizes. 
Now, I want to take a, a better look at one of the bowls and actually this bowl, studying this bowl and trying to understand its uh, decoration uh, brought me to think about the possible uh, Cypriot uh, connection, excuse me. So as you can see, uh, this bowl has uh, in a re register around it, a, a depiction of seven birds. And when you look at them very closely, we don't see their legs, but they seem to have a collar, uh, meaning that these could be maybe pigeons or falcons. So this is a bowl from Safad and there are another uh, two bowls um, one from Nazareth, from the excavations of Bagatti, and another one, um, oh, I don't remember now, um, from the Damascus Citadel, yes, um, that also have small fragments uh, of birds. And actually, uh, Marcus Milwright has suggested that the, a fragment uh, from Nazareth was a, a crusader uh, bowl. But we actually have the uh, birds also on Cypriot bowls. And here you can see even uh, an example from the 14th century of a, even quite a similar uh, bird. And this is actually what brought me to uh, think about the, the connection uh, and maybe that the Cypriot bowls were inspiration for uh, these local bowls. And here you can even see a, a bowl with birds all around, um, all around the bowl. Of course, this is a different type of birds. They have, a, they have feet, maybe these are water birds. Um, there are also other examples um, of birds uh, around, uh, uh, arranged around the bowl um, that are even uh, more similar. Um, to Safad, I just didn't have the chance uh, to depict them. And even though they are different sizes, um, it is difficult not to think about uh, some sort of connection. Okay, so, um, so these are um, the Cypriot, what I call the Cypriot connection or the Cypriot segment of my research that I would like to see if I can uh, further look into um, during my very much anticipated stay at uh, Kari. So uh, wrapping up now uh, the larger project with uh, the Cypriot um, segment of it, um, you can see that there are more questions than answers at this stage. So what is the meaning of the imported ceramics that were distributed to so many small villages throughout the regions? What can we learn from the presence of Cypriot pottery in the Southern Levant? In the past, I have suggested that the few Venetian uh, vessels that arrived at the villages uh, may be linked to the activities of the Venetians um, possibly as addition payment for the cotton or, or a, for a pilgrim's meal or a night in a hostel or as a curiosity or a collector's item, you know, something that the pilgrims or the merchants brought with them and left in the village. Uh, but today um, we need to reassess this assumption as uh, there's information for a wider distribution. And as I uh, told you before, um, there are some sites that a fifth of the glazed bowls are imported or uh, out of a third of the sites we have imports and some of the excavations at this site were very limited. We're talking, some of the excavations are actually salvage excavations in which only three or four probes were opened and then uh, finding uh, one fragment of uh, Italian vessel means that maybe there were many more in the site. So, um, 
So uh, the new questions that uh, I think uh, should be addressed now with this new information is, uh, was this pottery a continuing a intentional import from the Crusader period, albeit it coming in reduced quantities? And this is after uh, looking in the very wide scale importation of pottery in the Crusader period, we, we are having smaller uh, quantities, but still there is quite a lot of pottery coming. Uh, the next question is, can the ceramics uh, uh, tell us anything about the nature of the meeting of the European traders and the pilgrims with the local villagers? This is something that there are not many uh, historical sources or uh, maybe there are some that I uh, do not know of. Can their distribution help us identify where the Venetian moored their ships at the now destroyed ports of Acre and Jaffa or maybe at other smaller anchorages? Uh, we have some uh, hints for this. For instance, there was a, a, another horde of Venetian uh, coins found uh, in uh, Apollonia Arsur, which could be another place, a, a smaller anchorage on the coast. And finally, uh, the question regarding the Cypriot ceramics, can these few uh, ceramic shirts that I showed you and the possible influence on local production shed new light on the maritime connections between Cyprus and the Southern Levant? So uh, to sum up, uh, the imported glazed vessels found in Mamluk and early Ottoman assemblages from urban and rural southern Villa de Sham sites constitute the trails of the Italian merchants and the Latin pilgrims and the, that the Italian merchants and the Latin pilgrims left. They are concrete material culture reflections of their activities. Finally, I would like to state that it is necessary for historians and archaeologists to work together in order to craft a dialogue between the different bodies of evidence and to place a wide array of both archaeological evidence and sources in a comparative perspective. So uh, with the background of a drawing uh, from Montelupo, Italy, uh, showing the exportation exportation of uh, pottery by sea from there. I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really very interesting. Um, there's to be quite a few questions regarding this. I am not an expert in this period by any means, <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me kicking off with an ignorant question um, and we do have some other questions coming in already um, but I'm just wondering is it possible that we see southern Levantine traders also going to Cyprus and can it be like I mean if Cyprus is exempt from this papal exemption that they're basically going to be a bit of a meeting point for both directions is there any evidence of that um yeah this this is a I think that the historical sources um a hint, hint to this. This is something that I am planning to look uh, further into, really. But it, it seems because we have the Venetians on the island, and uh, and uh, we have the 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 um, Cypriot mariners able uh, to go uh, back and forth. It seems that really Cyprus was like a big. Uh, um, um, I lost the word, um, point where they brought goods from, um, from uh, the Near East and from Egypt uh, to Cyprus and from Cyprus, they exported them uh, to Venice and to other places in the Western Mediterranean. A transit, a transit point, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Constantinus Politus, would you like to turn on your camera and ask your question with your hand raised, please? 
Oh, wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edna. How are you? <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> it is my pleasure. Um, I have so many questions. We need to sit down and talk. Uh, <laughs> or whatever, meet. Uh, first of all, I just want to tell you that uh, we've submitted our pottery report for uh, Zawara Horasafi, and there's many bits of pottery that I'm sure you'll be very interested in. But for this lecture, uh, you know, we do have a very clear separate um, uh, imports, uh, you know, a base with a swirl, uh, swirl decoration. So that's, that's as far as this lecture is concerned, as far as this, the relevance of this lecture is concerned. But I had um, two things I wanted to, to, to mention. As you know, our site is in the south, south of the Levant, south of the Dead Sea, the Ghorasafi or Zawara Ezugar. Uh, you mentioned ports of um, uh, Acre and uh, the north, but uh, well, uh, with the, uh, Tel Aviv. Um, Jaffa. Jaffa, sorry. But yeah. as far as I know, and as far as we're concerned in the south, Gaza is the big port. Has any work been done there on this period? I know it's not exactly in Israel, and I know that there's other people working there, but you know, from, from what I understand historically, this is the big the big port before it was tilted up. Um, uh, so is there any work done in this period? The other question, if I may, second one, is we presented all this you know, beautiful pottery, glaze wares. Um, what are they used for? Um, I'm sitting here in Negro Ponte, uh, which is another medieval town. And uh, I just started a project with Juanita Vroom, I don't think is on this, um, in this lecture, uh, in this presentation. But uh, there has been a couple of bowls found here, similar to what you presented, which in Hebrew, or well, Hebrew mentioned the word um, kosher. So has there also, this is my second question, has there also been uh, has there has there been pottery that has mentioned the use, such as kosher pottery, such as the one I just mentioned, or that would help us understand what these bowls, these glazed glaze bowls, were used for? This would be very interesting as far as you know identifying groups of people, identities. Anyway, two questions. If I haven't confused you, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, as I stressed in the beginning, uh, I'm working in uh, modern day Israel. And unfortunately, I don't have access to Lebanon, to uh, Gaza. And okay. of course, Gaza was a very important port. And there are also important ports uh, um, to the north of Israel. Um, I, I am not aware of the uh, work uh, being done in Gaza. And if uh, there is somebody who is aware of our archaeological work, I would be glad to hear about it. I know that from a, an historical point of view, uh, Ruven Amitai uh, from the Hebrew University is uh, studying now uh, Gaza. So uh, mm -hmm. we hope to get more in the medieval period, Mamluk. And so we hope to get uh, much more uh, information. I just, you noted the Cypriot bowl that you have in um, in the museum in the low, lowest point, the, the Cypriot yeah, bowl that you have. Yeah. Yes, it's from the 13th century. So okay. it's a bit earlier than uh, the bowls that I'm talking about here. And uh, now regarding your question about uh, what the bowls were used for, of course, I didn't have time to talk about everything. I just uh, gave a hint when I showed the different sizes of the Cypriot bowls. Uh, and the uh, uh, Mamluk uh, local bowls as to the different dining habits. And of course, Yonita uh, Vroom has uh, studied uh, this topic extensively. And we also see it here in our region between uh, the Frankish uh, dining uh, customs and uh, the Muslim ones. Um, now, regarding your specific bowls with um, um, the Hebrew writing uh, kosher, this kosher. is very interesting. I'd be happy to, uh, if you could send me a... I think we're having a, a little freeze here. I'm not sure if... Can you... 
you hear each other? I, I didn't hear, but I, 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 it's published, I'll send it to her. Okay, I think I, um, we, my connection is uh, Yeah, I can send it to you, Edna. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Cyprus to Israel today, so we've expected a little bit of a, a lag every so often, but we've been very lucky so far, so let's hope it continues. But thank you. Edna, you have some thanks and congratulations on your lecture from Angel Kanari and Sophocles Hadjusavas. And there is also some um, questions or comments from Hugo Blake who's saying, although the design of your Mont Montelupo piece is similar to a type there, it isn't as good as C16 MTL products. And a second more general point, I favor mediation rather than direct contact to interpret the distribution of exotic ceramics, especially over longer distances. Do you have any comments on those points, Edna? Um... I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I, wait, I'll just read them. Um, okay, regarding the Montelupo piece, um, I know it is not exactly um, the same, but uh, there are some similar things in the book by Berti um, of, of the Montelupo, and I'll be very glad uh, to discuss it further uh, with you, uh, Hugo. And uh, regarding your second point, uh, mediation, I'm not sure that I understand uh, what you uh, mean by this. Um, could you maybe explain? Uh, Hugo, would you like to? Unmute yourself and ask this directly. Can I? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Um, I mean by mediation, going through various other structures such as markets. Um, if a Venetian pot is in the Levant, it doesn't necessarily mean a Venetian is involved in getting it there. Okay. I mean, there, there are many many, there's a lot of historic evidence, at least in parts of the Mediterranean I know, for things going through all sorts of hubs, especially fairs. Um, I have better evidence for this in the 18th century than I do in the 16th. But it seems that we tend to be just a bit literal in saying, because the pot comes from A and is yes. found in B, A and B somehow or other meet each other or it, it, it proves a direct link between the two. And I think in many cases, this is very unlikely. But you know, this is opinion, interpretation. I can be wrong. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, in the questions that I listed at the end, this was one of my, actually, this is actually what I was aiming to when I said that maybe it was some kind of intentional uh, good. So then it would go really, through the merchants and uh, being sold on the markets, etc. cetera. Um, at, at the beginning, really very, very few vessels were found. And this is why uh, we were thinking uh, more of the people brought it. But as I'm saying that more and more evidence is coming to light now that we are getting to know the pottery better. We're using petrography to identify the fabrics, etc then we really have to rethink it. And uh, if, if you have examples um, from this period, I'll be very, I would be very glad uh, if you could share them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Constantino, your hand is still up. Did you have- Oh, no, I, I, no, I don't have another question. No, I don't want to take it more time. I could, but I don't want Okay. Like you can take it off. How do we take it off? <laughs> take it off. <laughs> have some for Quinn like to ask a question directly. Uh, Jelena, yes, would you like to turn on your camera or on? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Anna, for this uh, lovely lecture. Um, I would just like to make um, a small comment um, regarding uh, your piece of uh, green painted uh, vessel of the Lapitos production found mm -hmm. in 
Jaffa. Um, you suggested the 16th century uh, date for that piece. Um, but uh, the production of that pottery in Cyprus goes until the 19th century, um, throughout all Ottoman phases. Um, and uh, pieces like that, we can see them in, in Nicosia and, and other urban centers in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I wanted to ask you um, how um, good is, is the context uh, of that find in Jaffa? Um, is it really of the Mamluk uh, date or maybe it, it can be an Ottoman connection of the later date between Cyprus and Bilad al-Sham? So thank you very much uh, for this comment. I actually uh, was citing uh, Demetra Papanikola Bakirjis from her book on the Lapitos uh, production. And, uh, but unfortunately it came from quite a small excavation and uh, the archeological context is not clear at all, as far as I understood from the excavator. And now that you are uh, giving this additional information, we will uh, look uh, into it again to see if it could possibly um, be coming uh, from, from a later period. Because this is really a period where there is hardly any activity. Although I always have to say that the activity in Ramla and Jerusalem is reflecting the activity there. Yes, yes. I mean, the production of that pottery uh, really does start in the Venetian and early Ottoman period, mm -hmm. but it goes um, um, through all Ottoman phases in Cyprus, and it is very common to see that pottery in the 19th century, like the same style as you showed. Um, it is actually the most common uh, glazed pottery uh, in Cyprus in that late Ottoman phase. Um, so yeah, if, if the context is not secure, um, yeah. Okay, um, the article was not published yet, so we still have time to add some information. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have anyone who would also like to raise their hand and ask a question at this point? And Nicolas Correas. I see. Yes. Art historian. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, this is a, um, a, I have a, um, a question and also a comment. Firstly, Cyprus was not exempted from the papal embargo. It was a, um, a Roman Catholic kingdom, but the kings of Cyprus had every interest to promote Cyprus as a meeting point for Muslim and Latin merchants. And uh, they acted as middlemen, therefore boosting their own profits. Cypriot ships tended to arrest Genoese and Venetian and other ships that were trading directly with Muslim lands like Alexandria or the Holy Land uh, under Mandarin occupation. But Muslim, uh, sorry, Cypriot merchants, Latins and even non-Latins did probably go there with the kings turning a blind eye because trade between the Cypriots and the Muslims was very profitable and it brought money to the royal coffers. So Cyprus was not papally exempt but the Cypriots actually busted the papal embargo. I have a very big article coming out okay. of this, okay? Um, the uh, comment I have to make, sorry, the question is this. Um, uh, in an article of his uh, on Lebanon by, I think, Albrecht Fuess mentions that according to um, Mamluk sources, there was a Cypriot um, uh, community in Beirut. He wrote an article on Beirut as a trading center in Mamluk Times, Albrecht Fuess, and he mentioned the Cypriot community in Beirut. And I just wonder, because Beirut is not that far from Northern Israel, maybe Cypriot pottery, pottery in villages in Northern Israel may have found its way there from or via Beirut. Okay, this is very interesting. Well, actually uh, the Cypriot pottery was not found in the villages, was not identified in villages yet. It, no. they, actually they come only or from the uh, port of Jaffa or from uh, Jerusalem, Ramla, and Tzfat. So uh, the, the material from Tzfat, which is in the northern part of Israel, could be coming from Beirut. 
Okay. But but there's also pottery coming through the port of Jaffa. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, addition. Okay. And 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 I well I read your article and I didn't understand it. The the very small uh, details of the uh, papal ban and the so thank you for uh, highlighting this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry. Very nice talk. See you in Cyprus. See you. Thank you. It is really super interesting, and you're absolutely right, Edna, that historians and archaeologists do need to chat more with each other, don't they, and get all these little details that we can't manage to find on our own. Um, is there someone else who would like to raise your hand to ask a question at this point? Or we'll just feel free to turn on your camera and ask it if you have a question for us. Okay. I mean, I just really wanted to, add, I mean, obviously, as we know, imitations of Cypriot pottery goes back to the Bronze Age around the region. And it does, I mean, does really seem that, I mean, it's throughout each period, Cypriot pottery is just so prized and so attractive and it is the amount that you're finding as actual imports is indicating. Would you agree? Hey, I'm sorry, I my connection, I, I didn't hear all oh, of your sure. question. Um, just that because of these probable imitations of Cypriot pottery that are pretty mm -hmm. widespread, there really must have been more actual Cypriot pottery or people from the Levant moving to Cyprus and seeing it than we're actually being able to see in the archaeological record. That seems... Yes, yes, reasonable. exactly. This is, maybe I didn't uh, spell it out clearly, but this is actually what I was uh, pointing to, that if local production is uh, inspired by something, it's something that they saw quite a lot. And uh, again, this could be connected to a... Um, what Nicola said about the Cypriot community in Beirut, because actually the um, fabric from which they were produced is from the lower Cretaceous formations that outcrop also near Beirut. So putting the archaeology and history together, maybe we can uh, uh, take a look into this also. Yes. Yeah. There is a question from Alex Rodriguez in the chat. Uh, you said that the size of a few pieces may indicate the eating plant. I am wondering, could the decoration of these pieces show any identity? Okay, so regarding the... Thank you very much, Alex, for your question. Um, the decoration of the uh, Mamluk pottery from the Southern Levant does not have depictions of humans or of other animals apart from birds. So as you saw, there's many, mainly geometrical designs, zigzags and uh, all of this. So this is also a way of showing identity, not showing uh, human depictions or, or other um, symbols. Thank you. And Nicoletta Demetrio has um, an interesting comment. She says, many thanks for this very interesting lecture. Information on the journey of ceramics from that period can also help shed light on other possible journeys, such as those of poetry and music. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, pottery is just one, um, one branch of uh, material culture that I'm looking at. And as I said, it would be great uh, to have a larger project and to look at many different aspects, uh, other cultural aspects, um, like you suggested. Uh, of course, this is very, very interesting and it, it would be interesting to uh, zoom out and look at the bigger picture. Thank you. Uh, James Scriver is asking, are there other studies in addition to ceramic petrography that could be carried out in order to narrow down the origins of the pottery or are they cost prohibitive? 
Yes, so uh, there is also chemical analysis, which is uh, uh, much more expensive. And actually, uh, in the Crusader period, I have conducted um, a very wide scale um, research on the, the provenience of pottery together with uh, Dr. Yona Waxman from Lyon and uh, Anastasia Shapiro, our petrographer. And what we actually did, we utilized both a petrography that looks at the geological formations and chemical analysis that looks at the chemical component and putting the results together, we can narrow down the provenience again, only if you have a, the pottery workshop and you sample a, the, what you find in the workshop, a, then you can for sure pinpoint a, the production site. So a, of course there are types of pottery that we have the workshops we, that the um, kilns and the kiln wasters were excavated and uh, for instance, in Beirut, we're talking about Beirut uh, all the time. And uh, in Beirut, we were able to compare uh, the chemical composition of the vessels excavated there with the vessels found in Acre and other sites in Israel. And for instance, we were able to establish that Beirut in the Crusader period exported cooking pots uh, throughout uh, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. So, um, um, so it, it can be done. Uh, we need a good, a well um, financed uh, project uh, to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, if we have no further questions, you have lots of uh, messages of thanks in the chat, Edna, and I will pass those on to you after we've finished. Um, but thank you once again to our speaker, Dr. Edna Stern. Lecture, I learned a lot. And um, we hope to see everyone again for the next Curry Lecture. But thank you once again, Edna. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And I hope to see you in person in another half a year. <laughs> mm -hmm.